Hey, it's Brian from the Doctors Who Podcast. On this episode, we'll be covering Robert Jordan's Eye of the World, Chapter 19. The company has entered into the ghost town of Eridol, clearly a once prominent and truly magnificent city, which is now left in ruins. As the rest of the party sets up camp, the trio of Rat, Rand, Matt, and Perrin decide to sneak out and explore the city. If Trollocs won't enter the city, they should be safe. Right? A treasure hunter named Mordeth appears and offers the boys treasure in exchange for their help. Mordeth leads the boys to a chamber full of treasure, but suddenly turns on them until a scream breaks the spell and Mordeth is left cowering. The boys quickly exit the chamber and return to camp. Moraine admonishes the boys and gives a history of the city and how it became known as Shadar Lagoth. She also gives insight into Mordeth and that he might be more than he appears. We'll give our thoughts on these topics and more coming right up. Hello and welcome to the Doctors Who podcast. My name is Chris. My name is Chip. My name is Brian. All right, so this is Chapter 19, Shadows Waiting, as Brian just told us. Uh, before we jump in, though, I wanted to uh, mention uh, YouTube viewer Scott Bishop for uh, engaging with us in the comment section this past week. Uh, lots of great points. Lots of things I didn't know. Um, so things like uh, the age difference between Nineveh, Egwene and the boys. Um, Scott was able to uh, really kind of zero in on some of that. So, you know, I think we we mentioned, well, would she know that Rand was not from the Two Rivers, you know? So, so yeah, there was a lot of great stuff there. So, Scott, thank you very much. Uh, we hope you'll continue to engage, and we hope others will do the same. So why don't we jump in? in and hear from chip all right so this one and the next chapter are still kind of two of my favorites and most memorable from the first time i read this 25 years ago but um i really like the way jordan sets up shadar logoth as this dead city it's so you know it's gone from kind of the middle earth type fantasy to now this is almost straight up just a ghost story in this in this chapter it's creepy, it's unnerving, it just has this sense of fear and impending doom all the way throughout. Um, and it's just, you know, the city of Eridol isn't just abandoned, it's dead. There's nothing living, there's no birds, no animals, it's basically a corpse. Um, I also like the dynamic that Nynaeve has brought to the party, um, where she's willing to kind of push back on Lan and Maureen a lot more than the, uh, the rest of the uh, Two Rivers folks. And um, she'll challenge them she'll kind of uh, push back, especially with Lan. And the kind of what Jordan is setting up here is very subtle, and I never caught it the first time I read it between uh, Lan and Nynaeve, you know, the, just the relationship that they kind of have together. Um, the thing that was kind of, that kind of not bugged me, but it just feels like Rand would have grown a little bit more to just quickly follow Matt like he did. You know, Matt's like, eh, let's go explore this dead city. Nothing, you know, the Trollocs don't come in here, so we'll be fine. But, uh, you know, Rand and Matt, you know, or, yeah, Rand and Matt kind of think about it for eh, a minute, and it's like, all right, yep, that's a good idea, but let's not tell anyone that we're going. <laughs> so, anyway, it's it's kind of fun, but, um, and maybe it says something about Matt and kind of his ability to kind of manipulate things and, you know, that, I think there's a little bit of foreshadowing here too with with Matt's character, but anyway, I'll let Brian talk now. Yeah, there were definitely a lot of things going on in this chapter, trying to figure out all of the backstories. I think kind of the big thing from here is uh, seeing the the lack of trust or the lack like of a relationship between Moraine and the rest of the party, like. Moraine clearly knew exactly where they were stopping and she didn't tell it, you know, to anyone else. They're all kind of just out there. And um, I, I kind of feel like there's still a level of distrust between some of the characters that they can't handle certain situations or um, Moraine just doesn't want anyone else to freak out maybe. 
but the entire ghost story aspect was a complete it was an interesting departure from from the book prior it seemed like it was as chip said you know like they're going along on an adventure then all of a sudden here they are seeing ghosts like uh, it just caught me off guard. I just was not ready for for kind of the switch in genre. Now I think there's some interesting details in here that that were not resolved in the chapter, and I'm curious to see where they end up. Uh, most namely, uh, Matt and a particular ruby hilted dagger. But we'll see where this goes. Okay, so. Um, things that I liked about this chapter, uh, and these are, these are fairly specific things that I've noticed. Um, you know, Lan, uh, is cautioning, I don't know if that's the right word, cautioning Nenev to take care with her herbs when she's trying to help Moraine. Um, and then when they're like taking care of the horses and getting them in the building, um, Perrin moves over to Lan's stallion, and the line there is, Strangely, the fierce-eyed stallion gave him no trouble at all, though he did watch Perrin. And that just kind of struck me as interesting, so I wonder if there's some foreshadowing there as well. Um, Definitely agree that running off, the three of them running off, is basically the height of irresponsibility and bad judgment. But this seems to be a trend so far. So, um, yeah. The the Morta thing I thought was really cool. Um, and just just kind of the the reveal, you know, you see this, this guy walks up to him and you don't know what his motive is. Is he a dark friend? Is he working for Balsamon to try to capture them? I mean, obviously, it seems unlikely that he is who he says he is, especially since, you know, he has no shadow. But um, that's just kind of an interesting diversion. And it's it's a great example of world building uh, because Jordan's taking the time to build out these things that don't necessarily tie back into the main story, uh, but they do provide an outlet for this place to feel more real and also for uh, the the party to kind of encounter these different things. Uh, it, it, it feels more organic that they wouldn't just stumble upon things that were pertinent to the plot. So that's what I've got. All right. So um, the, I don't remember Chip, or Brian, who said this, but uh, I think it might have been Brian that, you know, the Trollocs were afraid to enter, so they were like, oh, there are no Trollocs. Let's go exploring. Mm -hmm. You know, if a Trolloc is afraid to enter a place like this... (laughs) Well, not not just the Trollocs. The Fades were afraid, too, I thought. Yeah. It was basically, you know, anyone that's working for the Dark One was... Which is kind of interesting that there's something that has this much... There must be something of great power here, but it's not tied to the Dark One. It's a different entity altogether. So, you know, the Dark One's not the only evil in this world. And, right. you know, that they are afraid to enter it is is kind of a... It's kind of a fun way to, you know, show that they're not infallible either, that they're not just this, you know, powerful group of monsters that are willing to go anywhere. It's, you know, they've got their limits too. Yeah, and I think just looking at the name of this chapter shadows waiting you kind of know how this is going to play out before you even get too far into it right it's it's not going to end sunshine and daisies for them but um yeah the 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 rationale they gave was that they thought that uh the trollocs avoided it because it was you know the the greatest city during the Trolloc Wars, an ally of Manathurin or something like that. So it's kind of face palmy, but. <laughs> well, in the whole history of between the, the, you know, they were like twin cities or whatever and kind of allies and, you know, Manathurin kind of bit the dust because they were kind of making their valiant last stand, whereas Eridol basically imploded and, you know, cannibalized itself with, 
evil and greed and so i don't know i guess i don't know if there's anything in mythology that's similar yeah. where they were like brothers or sisters or siblings that you know behaved this way but anyway it feels like it's drawing from something yeah and... yeah it does um so when they so first i think like like the treasure right because that was whole, matt's whole thing was let's find some treasure let's find the treasure the question i had was was that like more death's play all along or did he overhear matt saying that and he's like ah this is how i can get him i i think the latter i feel like they were kind of wandering down the street and then they're like what should we do and matt was like oh yeah let's look for treasure and then suddenly there was a man saying like did someone say treasure right this way. <laughs> like right like how coincidental yeah. like it i but if if you remember at the very end when all of they felt all those eyes on them from the shadows i feel yeah. like it, i feel like to some degree mordeth is singularly placed but also everywhere at the same mm -hmm. time he's in league with these other shadows and kind of can sense an ideal moment when he sees it so I mean, I, I could be wrong, but up to up to this point, I think it's more likely he heard them talking about it and then used that as his way in. Yeah. Okay. And I can't remember if it was in reading the chapter or if it's from something else that I've read. So if if this is a spoiler, I apologize. Okay. But, but, you know, Mordoth's whole game is if somebody takes the treasure from the city, it allows him to leave. He's kind of bound within the walls of, of the city, so... So he's, you know, he may play this trick on others or he may prey on, you know, their, you know, things that they're interested in. So maybe he did hear Matt mention treasure and it's like, oh, there it is. Yeah. That's my yeah. end. And then when they do rejoin, you know, the rest of the party, they find that, you know, Lan's gone off to look for them. But Moraine mm -hmm. uh, recognized the name when she asked what had happened. She recognized Mordeth and she said, did he touch you? Did he give you anything? Or did you do anything for him? Um, and hold on. I made a reference to a page number here. I want to see what that is. Uh, ah, so let's see. Yeah, this is what you were saying, Chip. If he ever convinces someone to accompany him to the walls or to the boundary of Mashadar's power, he will be able to consume the soul of that person. Mordeth will leave, wearing the body of the one he worse than killed, to wreak his evil on the world again. Mm. Which, There may be some foreshadowing there, yeah. too. Just <clears throat> saying. Um, but that passage mentions Mashadar, which we haven't talked about yet. That's the, no, mm. uh, we don't actually see that till, no, next chapter I believe. Mm. So we won't talk we about won't. it till next I, week. I think Moraine warns them a little bit about it, but yeah, yeah, it's chapter twenty where that comes into play. So, yeah, yeah. The other thing that Matt does with Mordeth is, you know, he basically starts to open up and divulge. Oh yeah, this is who we're with. This is who everybody is. This is where we're at. And, you know, it's like, I don't know if Mordeth is slowly, you know, breaking him down or if Matt, that's just Matt being Matt, you know, well, because, you know, and I, we said intelligence and wisdom may not be his strong suits, but I think that's Matt. He doesn't think things through. Matt He's a little rash. Because, you know, back yeah. in the inn, he was ready to tell the, the person that's about true. the Trollocs and. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I have a question kind of in a subsequent scene. Chip, did you have something else from this particular scene? I was just going to say that when they actually get back um, to ta tell Maureen what happened or why they left, you know, Matt starts with, you know, we were looking for treasure. <clears throat> Perrin's talks about why they left and oh, yeah. mentions that, you know, Mordeth, you know, that, that, you know, it's just they all have kind of three different things that they looked at that, you know, when they let or when they got back that they kind of tell different a little bit different stories but 
But that goes more to I characterization. So, yeah. it, I, I do kind of feel that too is like uh, almost childlike in a sense where you know you you're a child does something wrong and they know they did something wrong. You're going to hear if if it's multiple kids, you're going to hear multiple different stories or multiple versions of the same events. So it, it almost does feel like there's still a lot of growing up to do. Like they've done some, but they're still kind of in that childlike state. Maybe that's why to answer my own question from before, Moraine is just withholding information back. Maybe because she knows they're just simply not ready for it. Yeah. Yeah. But now. I did have a question for the group, um, and maybe it's too much of a spoiler to answer it, but uh, when Mordeth was was inflating himself, and he was in the room, uh, he was inflating until he heard a scream, and there was a scream from outside, the way I read it, it was outside the room, and then at which point he instantly deflated and cowered in a corner. I don't think we ever talked. I don't think it ever mentions anything about what that scream was, does it? Mm-mm. Hmm. So. No, I don't think okay, so. Okay, let's 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 go to where Moraine is telling them about Mordeth and how he was consumed by Mashadar, but he didn't die from it. Is it possible the scream is something out there that Mashadar had ensnared and that's just like PTSD or something? That could be. I don't know. But that's a good question. I don't I don't have a good answer. I don't either, and I don't know if they draw power from each other in a way if they're like mutually bound there that mm-hmm. Sure. You know, by inflating himself like that, did Mashadar <clears throat> basically pull him back, or did, uh, I don't, I don't know. If I'm just spitballing yeah. there. Um, one thing I did want to note, a, note was that when Moraine's telling about uh, the history of Eridol and Mordeth, um, she basically says that. Um, let's see. Yeah, basically, you know, Mordeth was alive like a thousand years ago, and he had the king's ear and was soon only second to the king, and he whispered poison in Balwin's ear, and Aridal began to change. Aridal drew in on itself, hardened. It was said that some would rather see Trollocs come than the men of Aridal. The victory of the light is all. That was the battle cry Mordeth gave them, and the men of Aridal shouted it while their deeds abandoned the light. Um, that to me, I, I, I read that section and I think like Grima Wormtongue from Two Towers. Absolutely. So you still see these parallels, even though Jordan is, he kind of started down this Middle Earth road and then he was just like, whoa, but he's still <laughs> kind of pulling some of those comparisons and those parallels in, I think. So it's kind of fun when you're looking <laughs> instead of just reading for the enjoyment, but just kind of like analyzing what you can pick up. Mm-hmm. So, And then he also says, or Moraine says that, because uh, they're worried about land being out in the city, and uh, oh, Moraine yeah. said yeah. that land was pledged to fight the Dark One before he left the cradle, a sword placed in his infant hands, which is directly related to the viewing that Min had of Lan earlier. So, yeah. And then, um, the last thing we hear from is Lan coming back and saying that there are Trollocs in the city and they Within. need to GTFO. Yep. So, that's what we will pick <laughs> up on next time cool i like the when he mentions that it's you know well the mirror forced the trollocs into the city but what forced the mirror to do that yeah so yeah anyway probably the project manager 
that seems oh, typical. Them. Sorry if anybody listening is a PM. Um, yeah. We assume you're a good one and not the ones we've worked right. for. Definitely. Um, okay, so uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you liked what you've just watched, please feel free to hit the thumbs up slash like button. We also invite you to subscribe and use the comment section. Uh, we would love to carry on the discussion down there, so feel free to do that. Um, we will see you next week for chapter 20, which is entitled Dust on the Wind, which is different than Dust in the Wind. Um, oh. So, yeah, thank you very much. We will see you next time, and until then... Al on Z.